Um, I'm going to be in Philippians chapter 2 here in just a minute. Uh, I, I, I tell you, it's been, uh, it, it's been a very tremendous blessing for me to be part of this meeting here uh, this weekend. And uh, it's been good meeting so many of you. Uh, it's been good uh, being with uh, some, some friends that I've had for a while. Uh, Dick and I have been friends for I don't know how long now. I'd, I'd, I'd hate to hazard a guess on how many years. And, uh, and it's been good to hang around with Matt and Robert. And uh, I sure do appreciate the music Robert's been doing and messages Matt gave us last night. And I know he's going to give us some good messages tonight and tomorrow as well. Uh, I noticed that Jason didn't tell who was preaching when tomorrow. And that's probably intentional. So you have to, you know, you have to listen to both is what you have to do. Uh, but it's been good to be with Jason and uh, just, uh, and, and Matt, and I, I'm going to start leaving somebody out here, but it's just been good to be with you, and it's been a real blessing to me, and I just, uh, if I don't uh, uh, think to say this tomorrow, I just want to thank you for having us here and uh, letting me be part of this, this meeting. It's been a real blessing to me. Um, I don't know if you've realized this or not. Uh, but if you've been paying attention at all, I think you have to agree that we live in some pretty confusing times. Wouldn't you say that's true? When, uh, when uh, a Supreme Court justice uh, gets uh, nominated and, and is, uh, you know, voted in and confirmed to be a, a Supreme Court justice, in part because she is a woman. In other words, what I mean by that is that was part of the selection process was the fact that she was a woman, the uh, it was decided that 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 would be that spot would be filled by someone who is a woman, and that same woman can't define what a woman is. I would say we live in some pretty confusing times. It's really important that we have a woman, but we can't define what that is. That's some confusing times, and I think you have to agree that there's a lot of shouting on both the right and the left when it comes to politics. Uh, a lot of people are. A lot of accusations going back and forth, and uh, there's demands for apologies, and uh, uh, you know all sorts of things being hurled, insults being hurled back and forth, and uh, no doubt there's been injustices committed in both directions. And uh, oftentimes, uh, the people who are out there screaming for justice at the very same time they're screaming for justice, they're they're in the the process of committing uh, atrocities and violating laws and and uh, oftentimes violating the rights of the innocent. And uh, too many times the very ones who claim to be victims and uh, the claim to be oppressed are, at the very same time, they are victimizing and oppressing others. I don't know if, you, if you've ever thought about this, but if you, if you just consider history for a while, you'll realize that whenever you have one group that's oppressed by another group, the ones who are oppressed, Later on, that when they come into power, they start oppressing other people. That just some, seems to be the way human nature works. And we have people who are falling all over themselves to apologize for supposed wrongs that they had absolutely nothing to do with. And they're apologizing for things that they had no control over uh, in both the past and the present and the future. And uh, sometimes people are apologizing for things that just... Uh, just a few months ago, were considered virtuous, and now they've been demonized. In fact, let's be honest. It's really hard to know what's acceptable socially at any given moment nowadays because it changes with every hour, it seems like. What was acceptable yesterday is no longer tolerated. And what was, what was taboo yesterday is now being celebrated. And it goes, you know, every which way. And, and everybody is telling us what we ought to think, from athletes to celebrities to politicians to academics to corporations to news media. They're all telling us what we ought to think. I don't know if you've noticed it or not, but if you turn on the news, it doesn't matter what channel you turn it on. If you turn on the news, they'll spend uh, two or three minutes telling you the actual news, and they'll spend the rest of the hour telling you what you ought to think about that. And if you turn on one channel, they'll tell you you ought to think one way about it. You turn on another channel, they'll tell you you ought to think a different way about it. And uh, I'm not sure that any of them know what we really ought to think about it because nobody's asking what God thinks about it. And that's the real, that's the real key. 
But in times like this, I think we have to agree that it's difficult sometimes to know how we ought to speak and how we ought to act and even how we ought to think. You know, George Orwell wrote that book 1984. He wrote it in 1948. That's how he came up with the title. He just flipped the numbers around. Uh, and if you read that book nowadays, you'll think he was some sort of a prophet. Well, he didn't. He, he, got, the, he got the date wrong, I think. But he talked about the thought police. And we have that today. And if you think the wrong way, you're not allowed to function in society. But in the text that we're going to read here in just a minute in Philippians, Paul tells us what kind of mindset we ought to have as Christians, what we ought to think. And what Paul says here holds true, no matter where the winds of change blow, no matter what's going on in our world, what Paul says about what we ought to think and what our mind ought to be still holds true. And that is that we, are, we ought to have the mind of Christ in all times and in all seasons. Paul said, in, and, and I'm not going to turn there, but in 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul tells Timothy, be instant in season and out of season. I don't know if you realize it or not, but uh, the season for Christianity, as far as the world is concerned, the world thinks that we're out of season. In other words, they think that, that we, we shouldn't be listened to anymore. And so we're in one of those out-of-season times. There's, there's times when, when Christianity's in season. And, uh, you know, I wore kind of a dark-colored pants, right? And some people might say it's out-of-season for that because it's after Memorial Day. And, uh, and then, the, you know, after Labor Day, you're not supposed to wear white or something like that. I never pay attention to any of those things. But, you know, there, there, there's, you might find yourself in a time and place when people think, well, Christianity's in season. It's okay. It's good. And then there are other times, and I think the world we live in today, we're what you might call out of season. But we, 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 ought, to be, we ought to be true to the Lord, whether it's in season or out of season, regardless of what the world around us does. And in this passage in Philippians, uh, chapter 2 we're going to look at here in a minute, but I want to look at something at the tail end of chapter 1 first. Paul was encouraging the Philippian church to have conduct that is worthy of the gospel. In Philippians chapter 1 and verse 27, Paul begins this little section by saying, Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now, I, I, could, I could park right there for a little while. I'm not going to spend too much time there. But I just, I just want to say that... Um, there is a conduct that's worthy of the gospel, and there's a conduct that's not worthy of the gospel. And unfortunately, in, in our so-called Christian world today, you know, put it in quotations or whatever you want to do, there's a lot of people think that being a Christian doesn't have any effect on your conduct whatsoever. That you can still live however you want to live. But Paul says, let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Which, of course, means that there's conduct that's not worthy of the gospel of Christ. But I want to suggest to you something even more than that. That it's not enough just to have the proper conduct. Our conduct needs to be motivated by the right mindset. We were talking about this last night after services. And we were talking about how there are some people who will sort of consider the consequences that they might have to face if they do what's wrong, what's morally wrong. And they might choose to do what's morally right, not because it's morally right, and not because they have any kind of a commitment to doing what's morally right, but just because they want to avoid the consequences of doing what's morally wrong. And what I'm saying to you is that that doesn't get you very far as far as God's concerned. We have to do what's right for the right reasons. We have to do it because we have the right mindset. In fact, I think it, you might say that it's, it's impossible to have the proper conduct without the proper mindset. In other words, you might do some things that are right, but you're not going to consistently do what's right if you don't have the right mindset. And so here Paul turns in chapter 2 to the mindset that we ought to have as Christians. So let's just begin reading in chapter 2, verse 1. And I'll, take a, I'll stop and, and point out one phrase in particular as we go. But here's what he says. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. 
So I want you guys all to think the same, Paul says. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out, not for his, only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. And here, here's, the, here's the key phrase, I think, in this section of Scripture. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The mindset we ought to have is the mindset that Jesus had. Well, let's, let's read on and see what that mindset was. Who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Now, let me read you what my footnote says, because I think they've captured the idea here. Who, being in the form of God, did not consider it something to be held on to, to be equal with God. But, verse 7, made himself of no reputation. Let me read you the footnote there. But emptied himself of his privileges. I think that's the idea there. And taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those on the earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so the key phrase in this passage is, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. And so what I want to talk about tonight is what does it mean to have the mind of Christ? And the first thing I want to point out is that to have the mind of Christ means that you have a mind that is set on unity, not just union. And I get that from verses 1 and 2, right? And particularly verse 2 where he says, Fulfill my joy by being like-minded and having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Now the world claims that they want unity. But what they want, unity, when they say unity, what they really want is for you to conform to their idea of what you ought to be and what you ought to think. And, and they'll, they'll tell you tomorrow what it is that they want you to think tomorrow. I used to have a friend in high school that used to say things like this. If I want your opinion, I'll give it to you. In other words, I'll tell you what you ought to think. Well, that's the way the world treats us. But the reality is the world is never going to be able to have real, real unity the best they can have is union. Because unity means that you're actually in agreement. That you think the same. That's what Paul says in verse 2. But union means you might think differently than I do, but we're just going to kind of ignore that, and we're going to go along with the group anyhow, despite the fact that we don't agree with one another. And when you have a situation like that, you're not truly united. You just have agreed to act as though you are united, even though you're not united. But what Paul is seeking here is a unity of mind which results in a unity of action. Listen to what he says in verse uh, 27. We already saw that here, but he, I read part of it. But he says, So that whether I come and see you or I am absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Paul wants them to have one mind, and that is to strive together for the, for the faith of the gospel. Without Jesus in the picture, I, I submit to you that without Jesus in the picture, real unity where we have the same mind and that we, we are like-minded and we're in one accord and of one mind, it's next to impossible. That's not just true in the church, it's also true in our society as a whole. Have you noticed that since our society has become a post-Christian society, and that is something that's happened in my lifetime, we've gone from being a, a, a and, and Christian, I understand a society can't truly be Christian, but we went from being a society that was based on Christian ideals and Christian ideas and Christian concepts to being a, a, a society that as a whole we've rejected those things. Have you noticed that society has not become more united, they've become more divided? Right? 
And that's what happens because if we're going to say, well, we all want to, we're, we're going to throw out Jesus and we're not going to have anything to do with him, but we're going to all, we're all going to agree and we're all going to have some kind of unity and we're all going to have the same mindset, the question immediately becomes, whose mind is everybody going to conform to? You remember here in just a few weeks ago, they, they started the, uh, the ministry of disinformation. I always wondered, was that, does that mean that it's their job to, give, to, to propagate misinformation? <laughs> or is it their job to try and put out misinformation? But who gets to decide what's misinformation? You know what I saw in the news this morning? I haven't really been watching the news much the last few weeks, and that's been kind of a good thing for me. My blood pressure's been lower. I've had a bigger smile most of the time. Sometimes it's just better not to know what's happening on the news. But they, they, they said that... Uh, the World Health Organization has now decided that maybe we better take a serious look at whether or not the uh, COVID, uh, the COVID uh, virus came out of the Wuhan lab. I can remember when anybody who suggested that was considered someone who is just putting out misinformation. In other words, they keep changing their mind on what's misinformation and what's accurate information. Who's going to decide? If we're going to, if we're going to have conformity, how are we going to decide whose mind we're going to conform with? Why are their thoughts better than my thoughts? Why are their thoughts any more right than my thoughts? Who gets to decide what mind we should all have? But in Christ, when we're all in Christ, guess what? It's clear whose mind we ought to have. We ought to have the mind of Christ. In Christ, it's obvious that his thoughts are better than ours. His thoughts are more right than any man's. And so we know whose mind we ought to have, and we know whose thoughts we ought to conform with. It's the Lord's. Now, you might be able to force people to say all the same things. You might be able to force people to do that. You might be able to force people to do all the same things. By the way, when I was in China, um, I was, we were on a train, and with my interpreter, and uh, this was in 1991, and uh, he, he, we got talking just briefly about Tiananmen Square, and he kind of whispered in my ear about it, and I started to say something, and he shushed me, and he said, you can be arrested at any time. There are places in this world that try to control what you say. I pray the United States doesn't become one of those places. But I'm afraid we're headed in that direction. You might be able to force people to say all the same things under the threat of being arrested, under the threat of being deported, under the threat of being, being tortured, under the threat of being beaten, under the threat of being killed. You might be able to do that. You might be able to force people to all do the same thing, but you cannot force people to all think the same thing. It's next to impossible to conform and this is the other problem, it's next to impossible to conform to an ever-changing standard of thought and speech and conduct. In 2007, I went to Moorhead State University, and uh, they, had been, they had had a homosexual who had come in, and he was uh, trying to say that homosexuality was morally nothing wrong with it, and it was good, and it was positive, and all those, and I was there to give a rebuttal. I wasn't the only one there, but I was one of them that was there. And I remember that when he, uh, when he had given his speech, he said, now we're not even going to talk about the transgender stuff because that's just too weird. That's just too weird. And I made the point, the arguments that you're making in, front of homo in, in favor of homosexuality work just as well for transgenderism. And if we accept this over here, we're going to have to accept the transgenderism. And they said, oh, that's a slippery slope. That's a stupid argument. That will never happen. Happened so fast it's made my head spin. And yet they're logically completely different. You know, the homosexuals have been telling us, wrongly so, but they've been telling us for years, well, I was born this way and there's nothing that I can do about it to change it. And the transgenders say, well, I was born this way, but that was wrong, and so i got to do everything I can to change it. And somehow they're supposed to be on the same page. I don't get that. I'm just saying that, when, when we throw out the absolute standards that Christ has, that the Lord gives us, that we have from God himself, and then we're just going to, we're going to make everybody conform to the way that they think we ought to think, well, it changes every five minutes. 
How can you even do that? But when you have the mind of Christ, you don't have that problem because, as Hebrews says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the rock on which you can build instead of the shifting sands of man's fickle opinions. You want to know how fickle man's opinions are? On Sunday, Jesus rides into town and they're laying their coats out in front of him and their palm leaves and they're saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And by Friday, the same crowd is saying, crucify him, crucify him. That's how fickle man's opinions are. But Jesus is a foundation that can withstand the storms of both life and death. And there's no need for any angry mob to enforce accepted thought or speech or practice. With the mind of Christ, we govern ourselves in conformity to God's will, not the mob's will. So the question is, why don't we have any unity in our churches? And why don't we have any unity in our nation? And why don't we have any unity in our homes? Could it be because we don't have the mind of Christ in our nation? And we don't have the mind of Christ in our churches. And we don't have the mind of Christ in our homes. What if, what if we had the mind of Christ in our nation? What if we had the mind of Christ in our church? What if we had the mind of Christ in our homes? Maybe we might have some real unity. But secondly, the mind of Christ is a mind of humility. Look at verse 3. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, each, let each esteem others better than himself. And he goes on to talk about humility a little bit further here, a little bit later. But he talks about how Jesus humbled himself in verse 8. Uh, how many fights begin with the attitude or maybe even the statement how dare they do that to me? In other words, how dare they do that to me? How dare they say that to me? Or how dare they think that of me? What if we had the humility of Jesus instead? You know what Peter says about that? In 1 Peter chapter 2, I'm just going to turn there real quick. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse, uh, verse 23, listen to what he says about Jesus. He's speaking to Jesus, he says, Who when he was reviled, did not revile in return. And when he suffered, he did not threaten, but he committed himself to him who judges righteously. Now, if you read a little bit more of the context, you'll see he had no sin, and yet he suffered for those who were sinners. He suffered, but he didn't threaten. And instead, he committed himself, and this is important, he committed himself to him who judges righteously. That is, in other words, you guys might be judging me unfairly, but God won't. He knows the reality, and he knows the truth. And Jesus, of course, died that we might live. You ever stopped and thought about, Jesus didn't, he didn't even defend himself from this lawless mob who cried for his crucifixion. When they came to arrest him and Peter pulls out the sword and cuts off Malchus's ear, Jesus puts the ear back on and says, uh, put your sword away. Don't you know that if you live by the sword, you're going to die by the sword? Don't you know I could call more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scripture be fulfilled? He didn't resist. He didn't defend himself. He didn't open his mouth to defend himself to Herod. And when the women of Jerusalem wept for him, he told them to weep for themselves and their children. And he took the brutal punishment of the scourging and the mocking and the beating and the crucifixion, not because he deserved it, but because we deserved it. He had every right to say, how dare they do that to me? He had every right to say, how dare they say that to me? He had every right to say, how dare they think that of me? But instead, he went to his death without complaint, without struggle, and without retaliation. You see, humility is not weakness. 
We think it is, but it's not. Humility takes great strength of character. There, there's nothing more difficult than to be humble when you need to be humble. He, he didn't call those 12 legions of angels because he desired our salvation more than his own vindication. He desired our salvation more than his own liberation. He desired our salvation even more than his own life. He wasn't looking out only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others, specifically you and me. So here's my question. Why do we think we're above insult and injury? Could it be that we don't have the mind of Christ? What if we had the mind of Christ when it came to humility? How would things be different in our world? How would things be different in our nation? How would things be different in our church? How would things be different in our home? But it's not just a mind of unity, and it's not just a mind of humility. It's a mind of service. Listen to verse 4. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Verse 7. But he made himself of no reputation, or he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. Now Jesus himself said, in Matthew 20, 28, he said, I, I didn't come to, ser to be served, but to serve. Now, that's really an incredible statement when you think about it. The creator of the cosmos coming to serve the creature. The one who gave us life and sustains our life, serving us. He left the position and the privilege of deity behind in order to become a servant to us. But he doesn't end the statement there. Jesus doesn't when he says, I didn't come to serve, but to serve. He goes on to say that he came to give his life as a ransom for many. In other words, he came to serve us even to the point of death itself. Now, there's absolutely no, nothing more unselfish than that. Jesus himself said, no greater love has man than to lay down his life for a friend. And you are my friends if you keep my commandments and of course romans talks about this is one of my one of my favorite verses of scripture actually i have lots of them but this one's right up there towards the top and jesus and paul writes this he says when we were still without strength in due time christ died for the ungodly for scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's service. That's service. The disciples were always fighting about who would be the greatest in the kingdom. You can't read the Gospels and, and not notice that. But that's the very context in, we, in which Jesus told them that he didn't come to be served, but he came to serve. Jesus told them they wouldn't be like the Gentiles where the great exercise authority and lord it over the others. In other words, dominate and demand. But at the Last Supper, at the Last Supper, can you imagine that? At the Last Supper, when Jesus is, is having that, that intimate moment with his followers... They're arguing about this again. Who's going to be the greatest? Who's going to be the greatest? How does Jesus respond? He gets up, wraps a towel around himself, gets a basin of water, starts washing their feet. He was their Lord. He was their teacher. And yet he served them by washing their feet. Here's my question. Why do we think we're above service to our fellow man and our fellow Christians? Could it be that we don't have the mind of Christ? Jesus, when he did that, he says, I'm leaving you an example of how you ought to treat one another. Now, the point is not actually washing feet. The point is service towards one another. But let me just ask this question. What if we actually did wash each other's feet when we met each week? I wonder if we'd have a little different attitude towards one another. 
Let me ask you this question. What if political enemies would spend a little time washing one another's feet instead of vying for power? What what if politicians and policemen took it seriously that they're there to serve and protect the public instead of serving and protecting their own self-interest and those of their party? Maybe we need to stop asking what the church is doing to serve us and start asking what can we do to serve others in the the church and others in our community. What if we had the mind of Christ when it comes to service? How would that change our nation? How would that change our church? How would that change our home? But it was not just a mind of service, it was also or is, I should say, a mind of obedience. Verse 8. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Now, I think it's self-evident as we look around our world and our society and even our churches and in our homes, we recognize that we kind of have trouble with obedience. I don't know about you. I find obedience kind of hard. I remember when we hadn't been married very long at all, uh, my wife, you know, she uh, wanted me to do something, and uh, I, I, you know, how if we're not careful, we just find ourselves barking out orders to one another, and uh, I don't even remember what it was she asked me to do, but she asked it in such a way, I I looked at her and said, are you asking me or are you telling me? And uh, she's never forgotten that. And uh, sometimes she just says, I'm telling you. That's the way it is. I'm telling you. That's the, you know, that's the way it goes. But, but my point is there's all the difference between asking and telling, right? Because somehow if you ask me to do something, that, that's okay, okay, I'll do that. But you tell me to do it, I'm like, who are you to tell me what to do? Isn't that our reaction? Well, we have, we have trouble. We have to, if we're going to be honest about it, we have to admit we have trouble with obedience. This is one of the hardest things for us as human beings to accept. And yet, it flows naturally from the, from the previous two. If we have a mind of humility, and we have a mind of service, obedience ought to flow pretty naturally from that. Why doesn't obedience flow naturally for us? Because we don't have a mind of humility, and we don't have a mind of service. When we are centered on self and our desires, obedience becomes impossible. Because we want to be in charge. We want to be God. Now let's, let's admit it, we like to be obeyed when we tell people to do things. In fact, we even expect it at times. But we don't very much like to obey ourselves. Have you noticed, especially in the past couple of years, I think it's been pretty obvious that our leaders are pretty good at making laws for us that they themselves don't obey. Why is that? Well, because the same reason we like to make rules for other people and then not obey them ourselves. But you notice that even Jesus had to learn obedience as a son. Let let me read that to you from Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 8. Here's what it says. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. What does it mean to learn obedience? I'm I'm not going to take much time on this, but let me just say, the the concept of obedience is not difficult intellectually. We understand what that means intellectually, right? But it's kind of a difficult one sometimes experientially. In other words, I understand that obedience means we do what we're told to do. And we don't do what we're told not to do. But then... When it comes to the actual doing or not doing, sometimes we find it difficult because it takes humility and it takes a servant mindset in order to obey. Now, our text says that Jesus became obedient even to the point of death. Let me ask you a question. Does our obedience to the Lord or our obedience to the law or our obedience to parents end in our death you know obeying god leads to life that's what he says in deuteronomy right i set before you life and death choose life and uh what you choose life is you do what i tell you 
right? And you don't do what I tell you, you're choosing death. In other words, I'm saying to you, Jesus obeyed even to the point of death, but when we obey that, that that's actually life for us. Obeying the law leads to life without fear, Romans tells us. And he's talking, I'm talking there about the law of the land. That's what Paul says in Romans chapter 13 in the first seven verses or so. He's saying that when we obey, we don't have to be afraid because they're not a terror to those who obey, that our rulers aren't, but they're a terror to those who, who don't obey, who are evildoers. And obeying parents, it's the first command with promise that you might live long. So I'm simply saying to you that Jesus was willing to obey even when it caused his death. But if we obey the Lord, that's what brings life. And when we obey government, it leads to life. And when we obey our parents, it leads to life. So why do we have so much disobedience to the Lord? And why do we have so much disobedience to the law? And why do we have so much disobedience even to parents? Could it be that we don't have the mind of Christ? What if we had the mind of Christ when it comes to obedience? How would that change our nation? How would that change our church? How would that change our homes? How would our world be different if everybody had the mind of Christ? How would our life be different if we had the mind of Christ. Why is our nation in so much trouble right now? Oh, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, it's the leadership we've got in Washington. Well, partly. But that's not the root of it. Let me tell you why we're in so much trouble in this nation right now. We have generations that were not taught the golden rule. You know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Unto you. And so they are out for themselves first and foremost. They weren't taught the Ten Commandments, and so they didn't learn thou shalt not steal or thou shalt not murder. They weren't told, blessed are the meek, for they'll inherit the earth. They, they, they weren't taught, blessed are the peacemakers, for they'll be called the sons of God. They weren't told about self-sacrifice of Jesus on Calvary. And they've not seen the self-sacrifice demonstrated by those who profess to follow the Lord. They weren't taught to pray to the Lord, and so they scream at the government. I could go on, but you get the idea. We don't have the mind of Christ. And so our nation is reaping what it has sown for the past 50, 60 years or so. Prayer, by the way, was taken out of school in 1962. That happens to be 60 years ago. We're reaping what we've sown. We need revelation from God. Pro Proverbs says it this way. Proverbs chapter, chapter 19, or 29 rather, and verse 18. Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 18. Listen, listen to what it says here. This is the, this is the New King James Version where there is no revelation. And that's the idea there, prophetic vision. Where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. But happy is he who keeps the law. You see, the problem is, is that in our society, we've taken the revelation from God and we've thrown it out. And we wonder then why people cast off restraint. But happy is he who keeps the law. Without the mind of Christ, we're going to continue to have all sorts of evil in our world. And we're going to continue to have all sorts of evil in our churches. And we're going to continue to have all sorts of evil in our homes. The change that we need is not going to come through political action. It's not going to come through elections. It's not going to come through demonstrations. It's not going to come through protests. It's not going to come through riots. It's not going to come through looting. It's not going to come through burning our cities. And it's not going to come through assassinating our judges. That change is not going to come from police departments. And it's not going to come by abolishing, by abolishing the police. The change can only happen one person at a time. And it starts with each one of us individually. 
when we decide that we are going to have the mind of Christ. And if you don't have the mind of Christ, let me suggest to you that today is the day to make that change. And let me go one step further before I close, or as I close, here for tonight. If the people around you don't have the mind of Christ, today is the day to talk to them about that. Because our world's not going to change until we take the mind of Christ and put it into our own thinking and we convince others to do the same. That's called evangelism. That's a lost concept in so many of our churches. But we need to find it again. Because that's the only way that it's going to change. What can fix this world? Only one thing. The Lord Jesus Christ.